weak for the middle. And then you'd have a, an even more complex multi-column primary key for that. And you have to mark the others, you know, part of the key as a foreign key, because part of the key comes from somebody else. So just A is the foreign key here. B and A is the foreign key here. Um, but what we can do is we can notice that, okay, well, what we really have is just some thing, B A, is referring to exactly one row from the other table. So we need some way of referring to exactly one row from the other table. So if instead, let's just say we make B A unique. That's, that's what we ultimately need out of translating from the ER diagram into tables. We need the combination of B and A to be unique. Okay, so let's make that a candidate key, UQ. So that achieves the same goal. Then we can just add a primary key that's a single column, a small integer type. Just make something up, BID. And as long as you have a uniqueness constraint there and a uniqueness constraint there, you're guaranteed that every a, B pair is matched up with exactly one B, I, D. So in other words, a B, I, D identifies a B, A pair. It identifies a row in this middle table. Now, instead of importing the entire B, A key into the table on the right, we can just import B, I, D. Because every BID represents one row in the middle of the table. Okay. And we mark that as a foreign key. If we continued down the line, we would make the combination of BID and C unique, and then add a new primary key to C. So a more concrete example coming directly from the elements. Um, so we'll start with the strong entity set that supports this entire long chain of, of weak entities. Um, so the, the key of, sorry, we're not starting with the strong entity set. We're starting with the first weak entity set. Of course, this is the first weak entity set. The strong entity is departments. So the key for this first one is department combined with numbers. So department comes from a different table, which is why it's marked as foreign key. Combination of those two identifies a course. And then the combination of those two plus a semester identifies a class. So let's um, just look at this again. We have a tuple of two things as a foreign key. So using that strategy, what if I just say, OK, I'm going to take my two columns in courses, make them unique with UQ, add a new primary key that's a single column and an integer. We call it just CID, make something up. Now we know that every department, comma, num combination is uniquely identified by one CID. So we can now just import CID into the other table instead of importing both of those columns. Then, so we're moving down the chain. So this was the first weak entity set. This is the second weak entity set. I'm now identifying a class with a CID combined with semester instead of three things department and num and semester. I can now identify it with just two points. Okay. So starting from here, I'm going to move everything over to the left because we have more on the chain. So I'll move classes over to the left, and we can do the same trick. Make CID and semester just a normal unique candidate key, and add a new primary key called class ID. Now assignment categories can just use one thing to represent 
everything in front of the chain up to that point. So class ID effectively represents a department, a course number, and a semester. It represents all three of those things because we're just combining them as we go down the chain. Okay, and we would just continue that from by being <coughs> that combined with the assignment category name, unique, and add a new primary key. And that's not even the end of it. There's another weak entity set after that. So we would just keep going like that. Any questions there? So let me ask, why is this important? I've said it a few times. Um, the, the reason is you want primary keys to be, you, you want to be able to quickly compare them. So you, in a computer, you can quickly compare two ints with a single instruction. If you had some long string, or a string plus a number, plus a date, plus some other thing, that's a lot more work to compare two things. The other reason is you want them to be small, because they get copied into other tables. This is, this is kind of how foreign keys are represented. This is how indexes work when you, when you build those data structures around tables. They actually just use the primary key to reference uh, pointers to other tables. So you want the primary key to be small. You want it to be quickly comparable. It's also just you don't want these tables to have tons and tons of calls. Question. So this is just in translating to the table. We're, we're not going to go back to the ER diagram and like make it different, right? Correct. So very next slide. All of this stuff I just talked about, this is not part of the ER model. This is, this is just an optimization when making tables. So in fact, you can even you can translate to tables first, just with a direct translation. Then you can go apply this as an optimization after you've kind of thought about uh, your, how your tables work. Yep. And you would do this optimization before making the yeah, you should do this before creating the table. So kind of just translate into tables on paper if you want. Then think about, OK, well, all of three of these things is the primary key, so I'll just collapse that into one primary key column. But you have to remember, you can't just add a primary key. You have to make what was the primary key unique. So that just becomes an additional uniqueness constraint. Okay, so general rule of thumb for doing this is if you have a compound primary key, meaning more than one column, then you want to do this. Even if you don't have a compound primary key, if you have a non-integer or large data type, uh, like a long string, then you want to do this anyway. Just make, make the string unique and then add a new small int primary key column. Uh, small strings are okay. So like when you know the number of bytes in the string is limited to a few. In our case, the department IDs will be limited to four characters. So that's fine as a primary key. Okay. So any more questions on that? Um, this uniqueness constraint is enforced whenever you try to add something to the table, right? The uniqueness constraint is enforced when you try to add something to the table. So then if you did have a bunch of long strings, would it then have to go through and like match them all to make sure you're not like would that be a so if you problem? if you have a uniqueness constraint on long strings and you try to add a new string, yes, it does have to go and make sure that that other string doesn't exist anywhere in the table. But it's not uh, it's not a linear operation to do that. It's logarithmic if there's a if there's a tree built on that. Okay. So again, I want to I want to emphasize this is just an optimization. This is not for correctness. Um, so it's not part of the ER model. It's not even required in SQL. It'll just be a lot faster. Um, and there are exceptions to this rule. You don't always do. So I, I have this rule of thumb here. You don't always do that. Sometimes. It is actually better just to leave your primary key as some something else that's not a, that's not an int. 
the best way to answer that question, well, first you have to know what kinds of queries are you going to be doing, and you have to know how the DBMS executes those queries, which we will study later in the semester. Um, but the ultimate answer is you just have to profile. Is your, is your complex or large key causing performance problems? And you can't actually profile SQL um, with, if, if the DBMS supports it, with, which my SQL does. OK. Um, query by instance. I want to talk about this in relation to homework two. I've been getting some questions, or sorry, homework three. I've been getting some questions about that. So. Let's look at an example. Okay, find the names of any player with LO rating 2850 or higher. So remember, query by instance is where you use specific knowledge of the instances uh, to formulate your query rather than writing a general query. So a lot of people have been asking, like, well, if you if you use 2850 in your query, isn't that query by instance? No. 2850 here is not specific knowledge of the tables. This is directly part of the question we're trying to answer. <coughs> we don't know who in the tables, if anyone, has a rating higher than that. So you have to put the number 2850 into your query in order to answer this question. Query by instance, an example of query by instance to answer this question would be, let's go up to the tables. Query by instance would be, select name from players where PID equals 1 or PID equals 4. That's where you'd be using specific knowledge of this table to technically get the same answer, but it only works on this instance. Okay. Any questions about that? So query by instance doesn't mean like you can't put constants into your query. If you have to put constants into your query if that constant is part of the question you're trying to answer. Like Magnus Carlson. That's a constant, but it's part of what we're trying to answer. So this the string Magnus Carlson is going to show up in this query no matter what. I was just gonna say like uh, query by I don't know. Part of knowledge or whatever, sometimes the preferential, you just leave a note. It's like this is explaining what this is. Like, this is the only form key I want instead of doing a complex set of joins. So, would query by instance ever be preferential? I suppose, I suppose yes, if you're doing some extreme optimization. Um, but you would have to, first of all, know that that optimization is worth it. And, like you said, you'd have to document it so that. Anyone else that sees that query knows what you're doing. That, does that answer your question? But the first rule of optimizing is don't. So you will always just avoid query by instance in this class. OK. One more thing on homework two. Um, so Grandscope asks you to label which page each problem is on. Um, for homework one, we just did part one, part two, part three, et cetera. For homework three, um, I did that for some of the parts, even though all of them have subparts. So there's like part one, question one, part one, question two. Um, only some of the parts will ask you to label the subparts. So just don't be confused by that. Just label the ones that, are, that it asks you to label. The reason for that is it helps us divide up who, who grades what. So, you know, don't worry about it, really. It doesn't matter why we do it, just um, you're going to be asked to label some of the subparts this time. Just wanted to make sure that everyone knows. That. Okay. And then, so also related to homework three. Um, is I want to talk more about the renaming operator. But before I do, I want to say you can do all of homework three without uh, what I'm about to talk about. You do need to use the renaming operator, but not in this way. Um, so you can use it to rename 
columns, not just entire tables. So an example of why we want to do this. Let's say um, you've, you've done some queries to, to get some, some relation that you've renamed to white and some relation that you've renamed to black. And they contain WPIDs and BPIDs. Like maybe it's, you know, all of the people who have played as white during a certain year or something like that. And you want to union them. So the question is, what is the name of the column in, in the union? So technically they are union compatible because they are the same type. But then you can't really do anything useful with that union. So I have this question mark. <coughs> What do you project out of that union? Because uh, you don't know the name of, of the type of the, of the column. So what we can do is the renaming operator, the, the row symbol. Um, we've seen it just for renaming entire relations. But you can also put a subscript on it to rename columns within the relation. So if I have new relation and x. That's what we've seen so far. To say some, some relation x, I want to rename it to new relation. But you can put a subscript on it with put a slash. So you do new column name slash old column name. And that just means x had something called old call one. And I want, I want new relation to have something called new column that corresponds to that old column. Okay. So as an example, let's say we have those white and black relations with incompatible column names, and I want to union them. So I can first just do rename WPID to PID in a relation called new white, and rename BPID to PID in new black. Now I can union them because the, columns, the column names match. Okay. Is there a way to inline that type of renaming, like a projection? Is there a way to inline this type of renaming? Yeah, so we're not creating a new relationship. Yeah, so where, wherever you did this, wherever you created this white table, you could just do the column renaming inside of there instead of, <laughs> instead of this extra step of taking that table and then just renaming it. I just showed it this way because we don't know what the relation is that generated this temporary white table. So I think uh, another implication of the renaming operator is that it's narrow instead of Yeah, there are unfortunately lots of different notations in relational algebra. So some of them, some of them actually do this. They'll do something like one arrow and then like new name. <coughs> where one is a column index. We haven't been talking about columns in terms of any kind of order. Um, there's also like new, or rather I think it's old arrow new, old name, new name. Use, I'll, I'll prefer this syntax, the slash syntax. Um, but just be aware, like you will see other syntaxes. Okay. So remember last time we talked about um, a few things. I want to so I'm just kind of quickly recap so, so we can look at that one. Um, as part of renaming, so on the topic of renaming, we can create nested queries in SQL. So here is a nested query. And then to rename it, we use the as keyword. So I'm making a nested query in temporary temporarily naming it as the X. I can then join that with something else. I can then select something out of all of them. Okay? And doing that helps us formulate intersection. So find all of the um, addresses that are both corporate and retail. So nested select of all of the corporate addresses. Nested set of the retail addresses. Natural join them together, and then select everything from there. Natural join is like an intersect if 
the schemas match. We also saw another way to formulate intersect using in. So select address to incorporate where address is in a nested select. The difference here is um, this nested select does not need to be renamed with as. You only need to rename it if it's going to be involved in a join. That's just due to the way the DBMS works. It has to know names for columns that are being joined with other tables. And if I didn't rename this, then there would be ambiguity, like, what is the column called? Okay. And then set difference we saw, you just use not. Kind of the opposite of intersect. So select address from corporate, where address not in, select address from retail. Okay, and then we got to this, which I left as a kind of a, a take home exercise. So all patrons who have not checked out a book, and all patrons who have checked out the Lorex and Harry Potter. So hopefully you've had some time to think about that. Let's, let's do it. So all patrons who have not checked out a book. The best way to think about SQL queries is inside out. And if you're, if you're doing like a set difference, then you kind of start to think about it from, well, what is the opposite of what I need? So I can subtract that from everything. So what I will start with a very simple query inside out. Let's start with something really simple. I'm going to select card num from checked out. So that's just card nums of people who have checked out. So if I want names of people who have not checked out, I'm going to wrap that up into a SQL <coughs> query. I'll put some space there so I just remember that whole thing is card numbers of people who have checked out the book. And then I will select name from patrons where card num not in those, those card numbers who have checked out. So Ann and Ben have not checked out the book. Okay? That one's pretty straightforward. All patrons who have checked out the Lorex and Harry Potter. And I gave a hint, try not to think of it in terms of divide, because divide is difficult to do in SQL. We, we will see how to do it, but um, think of queries, generating SQL queries from the inside out, <laughs> and try to start with the simplest thing possible. So let's just start with patrons who have checked out the Lorex. So give me card num from. So who has checked out the Lorax? We need to know title, we need to know inventory, and we need to know checked out. So it's going to involve three tables. So checked out, natural join inventory, natural join titles. Where title equals the Lorex. Okay, so one person has checked out the Lorex. And then I could easily just change this to Harry Potter to get the people who have checked out the other book we're interested in. So I started very simply. Now, what we want is essentially the intersection between these two tables. Who has checked out both? So the intersection in this case would be just patron number one. So in order to do that, I'll start with this query. Okay, so give me card numbers for just people who have checked out the Lorax, and I will put that in a nested query. Now I can do select name from patrons, 
where that patron's cardinal is in that set. That gives me Joe. So then I can do and cardinal in, and then we essentially need almost the same query, but we want Harry Potter. So it turns out Joe is the person who has checked out both. If we do select star from checked out, Joe has 1001, 1002, so natural drawing inventory. I'm just doing this to verify the answer. So Harry Potter and the Lorax. The only person who's checked out both of them is person number one. Person number one is Joe. Okay, let me kind of go back to this, this whole thing. Remember, it looks long and messy, but we started simple with just this thing in parentheses. Conceptually, that's easy. That's just all people who have checked out a certain book. The other big thing in parentheses is all people who have checked out another certain book. The rest is just intersect the two, join it with patrons so I can convert a card number into a name. Um, you could formulate this in another way. So I can do this whole nested select here as, uh, we'll call that more X. And then I could natural join. So remember, natural join is intersect if the scheme is matched. Natural join that whole other thing as HP, Harry Potter. Then you would just need to natural join patrons with all of that. So lots of different ways to do various things in SQL. And this is where it does start to matter which way you do it. So I've changed it from, I was using this in operator now I'm doing natural joins to do this. This is where it can start to matter, like one of these queries may be faster than the other. Um, this query, I could reorder these natural joins in any way and it wouldn't matter. But if I take this query versus uh, this query, where instead of natural join I'm using and in. It's fundamentally different. The engine might figure out the same way to do it, but it might not. We'll study that more later in the semester. But we don't really have the context to know which of these would be faster right now. Okay. Any questions? Yep. So you're doing more than enough to write the same sequence of joins on people twice and see what you're there. Is there any way to like optimize that? Or so I'm doing essentially the same join. So I'm doing um, checked out natural join inventory, natural join titles, and then I'm doing checked out natural join inventory, natural join titles again. The engine will automatically optimize that. Um, writing this in a way that where that statement only shows up once is actually quite difficult um, because if you're creating a temporary relation to be used in a join, um, you can really only use it that once, that one part in the uh, query. That part where you say where card number mean and then the, the relation that follows from that end condition, uh, does that relation also have to have a column uh, named card number? So does this relation have to have a, car a column named card number? Uh, no, but it does have to have the same number of columns as what I'm looking for, and it has to have the same type. So that's a good point. So I have where one column is in something, 
um, you can do where cardinum comma x or you know something. So you can look for a, a tuple being inside of another selected duration. And then whatever was in this nested select would have to have two columns. Does the order of the columns matter? Does the order matter? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So cardinum and x aren't adjacent, so that would be a problem? If cardinum and x are not adjacent, is that a problem? No. Okay. Ordering matters. Ordering matters. Adjacency does not. So, so, what, so what if the schema you're trying to match has like uh, in string, in string, and the tuple you provide is in string, but it's trying to match the first in string and the next thing? So if, so I'm trying to match two things. That means whatever is after the in keyword, you know what, let me, let me make this cleaner so we can look at this, at just what we're interested in. Um, you know, in fact, I'll just say, it's like name from patrons where cardinal comma x in something, okay? That means whatever is whatever the result of this select, this select has to have two columns. So, you know, if I did a whole bunch of joins here and the join resulted in like seven columns, I would have to select two of them out of it. And the two that I select would have to be the ones that I want to match first cardinal, then whatever X is. Sorry, but this is yeah, no worries. I think that's more So that that select so whatever you said could be in that in that resulting relation can have more than two columns. The so whatever I select in, in this not. specific case, you can have more than two columns. No. No, it has to have two columns. So I would have to do something like select z comma x from dot dot dot. So dot 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 itself can have as many columns as, as you want. But I have to select two of them out of it. Thank you. OK. Suppose we want to find all the people with the same phone number. So in this example, that would be person 1 and 2. Both have this 555 phone number. Um, Three and five both have the same phone. So, um, oh, the microphone buzzing. So, this is a little tricky because the information we want is all stored in one table. Normally, the way we kind of ask, like, well, how does this row match up with some other row, is we join it with another table, but We've already seen this a little bit. Remember, we can do self-join. So if I join phones with phones, that's giving me the combination of every phone record combined with every other phone record. Um, why is that useful? Like, the phones table already has all phones information. But there's not really a good way to query, like, we'll find all of the ones that have the same phone number if you're only dealing with one table. The way we combine and produce conditions on data in SQL is with a join, usually. So this does give us the answer, like, wherever the phone numbers match, that tells us those are two people that have the same phone number. Um, or at least two records with the same one. Problem is, some of them, so this is just saying patron number one has the same phone number as themselves, which is obvious. Of course they do. Um, but here, patron number one has the same phone number as patron number two. So a lot of this data is useless. We filter it down. The condition would be where the phone numbers match and where the card numbers do not match. That would give us the people who share a phone. So in order to write that condition, 
phone numbers match, card numbers do not match. I can't do that if the columns I'm trying to compare have the same name. So let's work this out first in terms of relational algebra. Um, all I'm doing is, so the first thing I do is I create a copy of phones called P1, then I create a copy of phones called P2. Now I have all unique column names. I have P1.phone and P2.phone, and similarly for Cardinal. So now I can start writing the condition. So I want to select, so out of, out of this self join, P1 cross P2, I want to select where P1.phone is equal to P2.phone and card num is not equal to the other card num. So to do this in SQL, um, for similar reasons, we have to use renaming because we wouldn't be able to write that condition if there was ambiguity in the columns. So if I want to Find the people who have the same phone number, I can do select, I'll just start with star. Select star from, and then I'll just show you, I'll try to do phones join phones. It tells me exactly what's wrong, not unique table alias phones. So select star from phones as P1, join phones as P2. Now I get the whole thing. But now, since I have renamed column names, now I can start writing conditions. Where p1.phone equals p2.phone and p1.cardnum not equal to p2.phone. So this is saying that it's not the same as what was in the slide in the actual database, but this is saying that patron 1 and 2 have the same phone. We don't actually need all of that, so if I just select p1.cardinum, comma, p2.cardinum, that just tells me the pairs of people who have the same phone. Filtering this down further so that I didn't get the same tuple but in opposite order would be quite a bit more tricky. We don't have all of the operators needed yet. We'll get to more advanced operators. But this is actually answering the question. This is saying person 2 has the same phone number as person 1, and person 1 has the same phone number as person 2. Well, can we just replace the not equal with less than? And then Say that again. Replace not equal with less than, and then we will get rid of half the, the situation that's split. Replace not equal with less than. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I guess actually that does, it does work. It's a little weird because, uh, I mean, so you could do the same thing with like greater than, yeah. for example. So somebody reading this query would be like, huh? But so you definitely you'd want to document that. Um, Getting rid of these two things in a more general sense, um, where you might have like tuples with the same columns in, but in the same values but in different columns in different orders. Say there are like more than two columns here. Um, there are there are ways to do that, but we'll get to more advanced operators later. Yep. Is that like bordering on bordering by issue though? Because now how the cards are ordered. Good point. So you just need to know that they're orderable. This this does imply that card nums are orderable. And what we're really doing is not technically ordering them. So like like again I said it's kind of a hack. It works. You definitely want to document that if you did it. Okay. Um, here is, let me just go back to this. Um, so this works. There's another way to do this. I have phones as P1. You can just do phones P1 and phones P2. Just a little shortcut. SQL syntax is 
really inconsistent in places. Like sometimes you need as, sometimes you don't. You need as when it's when you're renaming a a nested query if you're going to use that query on the join. Uh, you don't need as if you're just renaming an existing table um, in this. So if uh, card num one shared a file with card num three, wouldn't you be um, using the greater than break? If card num one shared a file with card num three, uh, so wouldn't it get rid of all the card num ones? I believe it would still work because you have. So the other part of the condition is just that the phone numbers match, and then. Using less than is just a way of saying that they are not equal, but will not give me both sides. I don't know. I have to think about it a little more. I guess. Okay. So this is called this is renaming. So if I do something like phones P1, phones P2, um, it's renaming and it's called a range variable. So P1 here is a range variable. And remember, we can use the range variable before it's declared, after it's declared, doesn't matter. Um, you have to use range variables if you're doing a self-join. Because as we saw, SQL won't even let us do it. But then you know, the real reason for it is, how would I write this condition? If, if I just said phone equals phone, of course, a phone number is equal to itself. I have to disambiguate which one I'm talking to. You can use range variables when they're not needed, just if you want to kind of make a shorter alias or something. And then you can do x dot whatever instead of large table name dot whatever. OK, um, let's take our five minute break now. Um, all the joins we've seen. <coughs> have been something called an inner join, uh, even though we're not specifying it. So if you just say x join y, it's the same as x inner join y. So inner join is the default. Uh, x comma y is also an inner join. Natural join is an inner join. Um, but there, there's something called an outer join. So, You'll, you'll know what inner join means after we see what outer join means. Outer join is, uh, so there are two kinds. There's a left outer join and a right outer join. Um, the difference is, so let's look at left first. So it gives us all of the combinations of rows where whatever condition we provide matches. So just like an inner join, it's going to apply some condition to, to the combinations of rows. But then it also just gives us every row from the left table, whether it matched any other row with that condition or not. Um, right outer join is just the opposite. It'll give us every row from the right table and only rows from the left table that match. And this is where you need to use the on keyword. So when you're specifying the condition for an outer join, you can't use where. Say on, and then you can also say where after that if you have some additional condition. Um, so this still probably sounds a little weird. Like give all the rows from one of the tables even if there's no match. What does that even mean? Let's look at a little example. So patrons and check. Um, let's say I did patrons natural left join check down. So natural means the same thing. It just the condition is where the columns that they have in common match. So if I did patrons natural join, natural left join checked out, you would get Joe 1, 1001. Uh, you get Joe 1, 1004. You would get Dan 4, 1005. So this is basically inner join and so far. But then left join also means, OK, so I'm going to get everything from the left table no matter what. So you also get and, two, 
and Dan, uh, sorry, Dan Lurdy, uh, Ben. Um, but you can't have a non rectangular table like that. So, this, you know, this is essentially what it gives you, but the way it represents that is it just fills in those missing spots with null. So, uh, patrons left join checked out, and I'm specifying this is technically a it's like a natural join. I'm just specifying the other way of doing it. You have to use the on keyword. And if it's not a natural join, then it doesn't filter out one of the cardinal columns. But what it gives you here is there are some special values in here. These nulls, these mean, indirectly, these mean, OK, Ann and Ben, what? What does that mean about Ann and Ben? It means they have not checked out the block. So this table, what this table is giving me is some complex information. It's giving me every patron. And it's also giving me which of those patrons have checked out a book, and which of those patrons have not checked out a book. So we already, um, so here's natural left join. It just filters out the natural column. We still get nulls in the other column. So using left join, so we already did this question, find all patrons who have not checked out a book. We did that using not in, a set difference in other words. Another way to do it, use a left join. If I go back to this table, the information we need is here. It's basically patrons natural left join checked out where uh, serial is null. That will give us patrons who have not checked out a book. So it's a little weird though. I don't, so let's do um, select name from patrons, natural left join, checked out. So I don't need on here because I'm doing a natural left join. So the on is implied. And then I can do where serial equals uh, and I get nothing, which is wrong. There are patrons in here who have not checked out a book. The problem is this is not how you compare to null. You have to do is. So I get the same answer as formulating it the other way with a set difference. Um, but what is going on here? What's the deal with this versus this? Um, so what's going on is SQL uses three value logic instead of Boolean logic. So Boolean logic, what you're familiar with, is true false are the only two possible values in a logical condition or expression. Um, in SQL, there's true, false, and unknown. Unfortunately, it just uses the word null to represent unknown. So it's confusing. Null in a programming language is a known value. Null is, is a value that you can compare to. You can compare a pointer to null. Uh, in C, null is just zero. You can compare, you can compare an int to null. In SQL, you cannot compare um, five, for example, to null. Well, well, you can, but the answer is not false because it's three value logic. So let's look at an example. Five equals equals null. Um, don't read this the way you would read this in a programming language. Whenever you see null in SQL, replace it with unknown value. So the question is, is 5 equal to an unknown value? There's no way to know the answer to that, so we cannot say yes, we cannot say no. The answer to this question is, I don't know. So the answer is again, unknown. Um, but remember, the way that SQL represents unknown is with null, so 5 equals equals null is null. 
or in other words, 5 equals equals unknown is unknown. Um, so just whenever you see null, replace it in your head with unknown. I wish they just called it unknown, um, but they called it null. Um, so null is kind of special. It's, it doesn't have the reflexive property. In other words, it's not equal to itself. But remember, the trick is, think of it this way. Is, is an unknown value equal to an unknown value? Unknown. Uh, you cannot say true or false to that. So if you're ever using one of these like Boolean um, operators to compare something to unknown, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, what you do is you use is null or is not null if you want to just compare. So Boolean operators on null um, will return null. But re reword that in your brain. Boolean operators on unknown return unknown. Is 5 equal to unknown? I don't know. Is 5 not equal to unknown? I don't know. So we can kind of just experiment. You can play around in SQL. I can do, you don't need to actually use tables in a select. You can do select 5 equal null. Uh, oh. I'm using C style syntax. Is 5 equal to unknown? Answer is unknown. Is unknown equal to unknown? <coughs> is unknown is unknown unknown? <laughs> yeah, so what is five plus an unknown value? It's another unknown value. So so we select five plus unknown. Okay. Yeah, question. Does MySQL have like a true, false, data boolean data type? Yes. Does MySQL have a boolean type? Yes. You can put a boolean type on a column, and its value will be either 0 or 1. <laughs> or if it's if that column is allowed to be null, its value can be zero, one, or null. <laughs> Just like any column. Okay, so I want to look at this in operator a little more. Um, so select x from y where x in um, so this whole thing here is a condition. So you know normally you think of where as like so you could do where x greater than 5. That's a condition. Or where you know, x equal to whatever. Um, so this, this in operator returns a boolean. x in something is either um, true or false. Well, actually, it can also be unknown. We'll ignore nulls for now. Pretend there are none in there. Um, but there are other operators similar to this. So there's in. There's also exists, there's x off any and x off all. So let's, let's break this down. Um, let's go back to just in. So in general terms, x in a. A is a multiset. Multiset just means that it can, can have duplicates, unlike a set. And that's just because um, the result of a select can have duplicates. So the result of a select is a multiset. And the way we use these operators like in and exists and so forth, um, this a thing is usually <coughs> the result of a select. That's just the way that they're usually useful. So what do these other ones do? Um, in is easy. So true if x is in a. So when you're, when you're filtering out the x's from some relation, 
you will pick out only the x's where they are in the multiset, the nested select. Exists A. True if A is not empty. That's it. Just like if A has any rows, then it will give you x. So usually that means if you're using exists, whatever A is was probably produced with some kind of select that involves x. Otherwise, it would, it would return true for every x or false for every x. I think one way to do that is that like it's basically a join where you're not returning anything. Right? And you can still do, you can do an exist with a join and then add a where statement that would be the same logic as your exist. Yeah. Is this maybe be useful if you're modifying the table, but you're not sure if it's like something exists, like either a table or a country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you kind of have to use your imagination. It certainly is useful even when x is not involved in the select in, in some cases. Um, so x op any. That means, so op is a Boolean operator, like greater than, less than, whatever. So true if for all y's in the multiset A, um, x op y is true um, for, sorry, not for all, if there exists, if there is one y where the operator produces true, then it's true for that x. All is kind of the inverse of that. If it is true for all y in the multiset, then it is true for x. So let's look at an example. Like where can we use these? Find all students younger than everyone in databases. So let's see, people in databases would be student number one and student number two. Okay, so that's Hermione and Harry. All students younger than all of them would be only. Well, so he was born in a later year, meaning he's younger. So let's do this in SQL. I'm going to switch over to a different database that has those tables. So it has some older stuff in here, corporate modes, stuff like that. But it has courses and enrolled and students. And they contain exactly that information that was on the slide. So to create this query, I'm going to build it up from simple terms. So I'm going to find, let's just find the dates of birth of everyone in databases. I'm going to select DOB from students, natural join enroll, natural join courses. That's the date, dates of birth of anyone enrolled in any course. So I want where C name, course name, equals databases. Okay, just as we saw on the slide. 1980 and 1979 are the birth dates of Harry and Hermione. Okay, that's part of it. So wrap that up into a nested query. I'm going to kind of put some space there. So just remember, all that stuff on the right is date of birth of everyone in databases. Now, if I want to select name from students, where that student's date of birth is greater than all of those dates of birth from the databases course. Um, it's called S name, student course. And that gives us, so let me clear that. Okay, so a little confusing. Date of birth greater than, I'm looking for people who are younger than them, but a date of birth being greater than means you are younger. I have to remember when you're comparing dates, you're talking about like older or younger, um, let's get the logic done. Okay, questions on that? All right. 
and then exists, filtered by complex nested queries. So this is one of those operators like in, like greater than all, like greater than any. Um, there's also not exists. So these two things, they seem kind of weird. Um, and as we already discussed, like, you know, you can imagine situations where they're useful. Um, turns out they will be very useful in formulating division in SQL. SQL does not directly have like x divided by y. Um, it's fairly complex how to formulate this, but once you do, there's a formula for it, you just apply it. It's going to involve exists and not exists. Um, we don't quite have enough time to get into it today, so I will leave it for next time. Um, remember though, so quick announcements before we wrap up. Make sure you label your pages on Gradescope, uh, all of the ones that it asks you to. And I'll post the LMS uh, ER diagram solution so that when you start working on phase two, if you're not confident in your own solution, you can use mine. And make sure you have your partner selected soon, because phase two starts soon, and that'll be terrible. All right, see you next week. <laughs>